an outline and explanation of common childhood epilepsy syndromes, as explained by neurologist Peter Morrison. Hello, my name is Peter Morrison. I'm a neurologist at Maine Medical Center uh, with a particular interest in pediatric epilepsy. And today I'll be reviewing some common pediatric epilepsy syndromes. I'd like to start by just reviewing some definitions. Uh, a seizure is just excessive and hypersynchronous neural activity, usually self-limited. On the slide here is an EEG, and you can see the burst there, which characterizes the hypersynchronous activity. Now, epilepsy is a tendency to have recurrent seizures without provocation. And Dr. Morse talked a bit about epilepsy and different seizure types in the previous webinar. An epilepsy syndrome is characterized by seizure type, the EEG, typically the age of onset, and it gives you an idea of the history and prognosis, which can be important when counseling families. Now, there are a number of different ways of classifying seizure disorders and epilepsy. Again, Dr. Morse reviewed some of these. The standard is the International Classification of Epilepsies, put out by the ILAE. A practical way that I try to think about things in the office is, number one, the age of onset, how old is the patient? And then in general, is this a relatively benign epilepsy syndrome, although none really are benign, as we'll get into, or is this a more malignant syndrome? Today we're going to talk about some of the more common epilepsy syndromes that we encounter. The three most common epilepsy syndromes that we typically see in the office are childhood absence epilepsy, benign Rolandic epilepsy, and juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, and we'll go through these today. One of the more common pediatric epilepsy syndromes that we see in the office is childhood absence epilepsy. This is a generalized epilepsy syndrome that typically occurs in school-aged children. Seizures are frequent, typically occurring many times a day. They're relatively brief in duration, usually 5 to 20 seconds or so, and characterized by an arrestive behavior. There's no significant postictal period, and after the seizure, the child usually continues doing what he was doing beforehand. An EEG shows a classic 3 hertz spike and wave pattern. Sometimes a useful technique in the office when confronted with a child with staring spells is to have them hyperventilate, as this will typically provoke an absence seizure and can be a useful technique for understanding these. Absence epilepsy in general is something you outgrow. Typically, the seizures persist for a mean of six years or so, and in general, as you go through puberty, the seizures abate. This happens about 90% of patients. There's a smaller percentage of patients that go on uh, to continue struggle with epilepsy. The characteristic seizure type in childhood absence epilepsy is the absence seizure, the staring uh, arrest of behavior. However, there are also patients that can have generalized tonic-clonic convulsions. In general, this can be associated with the age of onset. If your absence seizures start when you're under nine, it's less likely that you're going to have a grand mal or generalized tonic-clonic seizure. If you're over nine, then this is more likely, and some of these patients go on to develop juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, which we'll talk about later. Traditionally, childhood absence epilepsy has been thought as a relatively benign syndrome that children outgrow. However, recent data has brought this into question. Looking at social outcomes in patients with childhood absence epilepsy versus another chronic medical condition, such as JRA, children with childhood absence epilepsy have lower rates of high school graduation, behavioral problems, and other concerning social outcomes. In addition, children with childhood absence epilepsy have higher rates of anxiety, ADHD, and other psychiatric problems. And frequently, when we concentrate just on seizure control, these problems go uh, unaddressed. In general, childhood absence epilepsy is probably not as benign as we once thought it was. Comorbidities are common. Treatment is not ideal, uh, and the social outcomes can be worrisome. Uh, traditionally, there have been three medications that have thought to be effective for childhood absence epilepsy. These include Depakote or valproic acid, Zorontin or ethosuximide, and Lamictal or Lamotrigine. Most of these studies were relatively small. Recently, however, there's been a head-to-head -head trial of these three medications. This was a multi-center study uh, performed by the NINDS. The primary outcome was looking at seizure freedom. And uh, for that outcome, ethosuximide was superior to the other two agents. And this also seemed to have a better cognitive profile. And so now ethosuximide, we can say with some degree of confidence, is the treatment of choice for childhood absence epilepsy. The next common epilepsy syndrome that we'll talk about is benign epilepsy with centrotemporal spikes. This is also known as benign Rolandic epilepsy. This is a common epilepsy syndrome that we see in the office. Uh, in uh, pediatric epilepsy, this probably represents anywhere from 15 to 25 percent of epilepsy that we see in children under the age of 15. The onset is typically somewhere in childhood, between 3 and 13 years of age. There's a peak around 7 to 10 years. 
These seizures are primarily nocturnal, occurring shortly after, after a child falls asleep. The seizures are partial, usually involving focal facial twitching, sometimes drooling, and the inability to speak. Classically, the EEG is normal when the child's awake. During sleep, however, there are classic spikes that emerge that help us identify this syndrome. In general, not all patients with benign Rolandic epilepsy require treatment. Seizures are typically infrequent. Up to 15% of patients will have only a single seizure, and more than half will only have two to five seizures. Seizures typically occur at night while a patient's at home, and so going on chronic seizure medications isn't always indicated. The syndrome is almost invariably outgrown. Classically, again, we've thought about it as a relatively benign syndrome, although there may be some uh, learning problems that go along with it. Uh, in terms of treatment, if treatment is indicated, there are a variety of anticonvulsants that can be used. I typically use levetiracetam because it's relatively easy to use and well tolerated. Carbamazepine is used by some others, but there have been some reports of this exacerbating the syndrome. Finally, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy is a common epilepsy syndrome that we see in older kids. It's the most common form of idiopathic generalized epilepsy, representing 5 to 10 percent of all epilepsies that we see in the office. Typically, this presents in the teenage years. Children or teens are previously neurologically normal and often come in with their first generalized tonic clonic seizure. In those patients, it's important to ask about brief jerks in the morning, which frequently represent myoclonic seizures. Children with JME can also have absence seizures as well. The EEG in JME demonstrates a polyspike and wave pattern. Patients may be photosensitive with seizures provoked by certain flash frequencies. Sleep deprivation, alcohol ingestion can also provoke seizures, and it's important to counsel patients about this. This tends to be a lifelong syndrome requiring uh, treatment into adulthood. So just to summarize, identifying an epilepsy syndrome is important for a number of reasons. It helps to find treatment and permits you to give an idea of the prognosis to the patient and the family. Common epilepsy syndromes that we see in the office, which we reviewed today, include childhood absence epilepsy, benign Rolandic epilepsy, and juvenile myoclonic epilepsy.